Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to discuss how to perform a good physical examination on a patient with cervical spondylosis. This is an excerpt from a broader course on clinical evaluation of patients with cervical spondylosis. If you're interested in viewing the full course, we've left a link in the description. So after getting a good history, obviously a big part of the evaluation is doing a good physical examination. And of course, I mean neurological examination for a lot of this, but we'll talk primarily about the full neurological examination when we're doing uh, an evaluation for a patient with cervical spondylosis. The first thing we look at is a motor exam. So obviously the exam itself is made up of multiple components, but the motor exam is the first component we're gonna talk about. I will do typically a sensory exam after that a reflex examination, which is particularly important in spine evaluation, gait evaluation, which is variably important. Sometimes it's more important if somebody's not myelopathic, you may not assess that as deeply. We talk a little bit about the neck, looking at cervical range of motion, palpation exam of the neck. Those are a bit more general. And then I look for a couple of very important things in select patients. I will look for a Sperling's maneuver that we'll talk a little bit about later. Do somewhat of a peripheral nerve exam and then talk a little bit about the shoulder exam. And I'm not gonna get into the shoulder exam in this video because you can obviously find a variety of resources for that and this is kind of outside of the scope of this. But I would say it's important for a spine surgeon to know how to do a good shoulder exam when evaluating a patient in the neck or a hip and knee exam when evaluating somebody for the lumbar spine. So these are the components that I typically look at. First thing we'll talk about is a motor exam. And again, when we do a motor exam, we're looking not only at strength, so we'll evaluate a patient's strength in specific motor groups, but also looking at the tone and the bulk, which can lend some insight into other neurological conditions that may be contributing to the symptoms. I would do a deltoid exam, so that's a shoulder exam, which is classically a C5 distribution. Now, a lot of these muscle groups, as you'll see, can get nerve function or innervation from different nerves. So, unfortunately, not every muscle, not every nerve has read the book, but these are kind of the classical distributions that we talk about and think about when we're evaluating patients. So, deltoid exam is the first thing I do, and that's to evaluate for C5 function. I will do a bicep exam, which is typically C5 and C6. I do typically pronator teres, which is a little more sensitive for C6. Sometimes you're not really sure if it's five, six, or seven. I find the pronator teres exam to be very useful for that. So there's holding someone's hand like you're shaking it and then twisting outwards. Pronation tends to be pretty dominant C6, I would say. I look at wrist extension, which is classically C6 as well, with some C7 contribution from the radial nerve. Talk about wrist flexion. Triceps, which is another big muscle group, which is often C7. So if you're looking for a C6, I tend to favor the pronator teres, that's personal. Triceps, I tend to favor ex uh, a tricep extension or elbow extension. Um, I will look at wrist flexion as well when I'm doing that. And then for C8 and T1, I tend to use finger extension, so kind of evaluating people for extension of their fingers, especially distally. And then uh, finger abduction, so kind of doing this to test for T1. And that gives you some rough sense of what muscle groups uh, uh, are affected when you're looking at cervical radiculopathy, especially from C5 down to T1. So from a motor exam standpoint, these are the motor groups that I typically will evaluate. The lower extremity, uh, I will always evaluate as well, but maybe a little bit more cursory, not necessarily looking at every muscle group as if I'm doing a lumbar spine evaluation, but I look at iliopsoas, quadricep, hamstring, and then ankle, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And the reason I kind of put this in here is because one interesting little factoid is people with myelopathy, preferentially what they'll notice when they have weakness in their legs is usually proximal leg weakness, so difficulty going up steps, getting out of a chair, things like that, where they have difficulty with some of the big muscle groups up high and dorsiflexion, so a foot drop. People will find that they're either slapping their foot or having difficulty picking their foot up, catching their toes. You think of L5 radiculopathy or L2, 3, 4, et cetera for IP. Um, but those can be motor deficits as a manifestation of myelopathy, either in the cervical or the thoracic spine. So I put it in there specifically because I look for it even in people that I'm doing a cervical uh, evaluation for. Now, in terms of sensory dysfunction, that's usually the next part that I look at. And I will typically look at light touch, sometimes pinprick and vibration. 
Again, if you haven't seen uh, a chapter on symptoms of uh, myelopathy I, or symptoms of spondylosis, I'd really recommend doing it. But this is one of the pictures that we show there. And you can kind of see that the nerves have dermatomes. We'll look at dermatomal distribution in terms of loss of sensation. And you're really trying to characterize, like, is that a C6 distribution, a C7 distribution, to kind of lend insight into which nerves are affected. So I look at these different modalities and try to figure out, is it nerve root distribution? Is it peripheral nerve distribution? Or do they have a sensory level which can be more indicative of spinal cord dysfunction? Now, one interesting little factoid is that the more distal you get along the nervous system, so that means from the brain, through the spinal cord, cervical nerve, down as you get peripheral all the way to the fingertips, the more distal you get, the more crisp the sensory demarcation is. So that's an important thing I learned from Dr. Spinner at Mayo, is that when, when people can draw a line on their finger and say this side of it is numb and this side of it is not, when it's that sharp, it's usually peripheral. A C7 radiculopathy can be a little bit more vague. It's still more defined than if people have something in their brain, where it might just be, if it's brain, it's just like my arm is numb. But when it's C7, it'll be like, well, this part of it is numb. But it might be a little more ambiguous here. It might be middle finger, part of the ring finger, part of the index finger is affected. Or for C6, it could just be the thumb. Maybe it bleeds over to C7. But again, the demarcation, the limits around them are a little more ambiguous as you go centrally or a little more crisp as you go distally. So that's an important point I wanted to make in terms of trying to use the sensory exam to figure out where people's symptoms are coming from. Now, after doing a motor and sensory exam, we routinely get reflexes. So reflexes are really um, interesting. We try to create a stimulus and see the reaction to that. So this is a good example of a picture that kind of shows like an afferent stimulus. That means like, you know, whether you get poked or you get hit with a hammer or something like that, you get an afferent stimulation and then you get a reaction that comes around through the motor fiber. So if you hit somebody's knee classically and it jumps, that's what we're looking for as a reflex arc. Now, this is a useful illustration because it shows that there is input from the brain that comes down to mediate that reflex. The reason that's important is because if there's a problem along the arc here, you won't get a reflex. You'll hit someone's knee, you won't get anything back. That's classically related to a nerve problem. In the arm, if you check a bicep or a tricep and you hit it and the reflex is absent, it means there's a problem typically here, somewhere along the way there. But if it's missing, function from the brain or the influence of the brain, that reflex tends to be exaggerated. So you'll hit someone's bicep and it really jumps because you don't have the so-called inhibitory effect of some of these descending pathways from the brain. So when we are evaluating someone's reflexes, we're trying to figure out is it normal, is it diminished, or is it increased? And those extremes are really important in the decision making or the analysis of where people's symptoms are coming from. So in terms of the types of reflexes that I check, I usually check them all. The pectoralis reflex I'll check on rare occasions. It's not often that you're looking for a C3-4 radiculopathy. Uh, biceps, brachioradialis, and triceps are routine. Every time you're evaluating someone for that, you're gonna look for that. I will often do a finger flexor reflex as well. Uh, and then looking at the lower extremities can be useful, particularly for spinal cord dysfunction. So looking at not only the knee and also the ankle to kind of see how those reflexes are affected. That gives you a sense of are we dealing with contribution from the brain? Is this a spinal cord problem? Is it a peripheral nerve problem? Is it a diffuse problem? If every reflex is absent, that gives you a sense there's a problem with the peripheral nerves in general. So this is why I think reflexes are such an important part of a good neurological exam. Now, from the spine perspective, there are specific pathologic reflexes that you may see if you're a patient or if you're a clinician, certainly you should look for. Um, in the upper extremities, a Hoffman's sign, which is usually flicking of the middle finger and looking for a little jump or a contraction of the thumb and the index finger, that's called a Hoffman sign. A Bobinski sign is a stroking of the bottom of the foot and seeing a toes kind of fan upwards. And then clonus is when you, and really you could see it at any joint, but classically at the ankle is when there's a, uh, abrupt stretching of a muscle that you get kind of sp people with spasticity or a loss of that inhibition will often have flapping that will go on more than four beats. We call that clonus when they have sustained kind of flapping like that. So these are considered part of the reflex examination and part of what we're looking for when we're doing the full physical exam. Now, 
the gait is often overlooked, but when I'm, when I, whenever I evaluate a patient, I try to get them to walk, and sometimes in just the clinic room may not be sufficient. You have to get them into the hallway to really see what they're doing. Um, and it's routine for people to serve, uh, their families to say, oh, they're walking much better here than they do at home. And that, you know, you have to take that into consideration when you're evaluating people in the office is that they're kind of on their best behavior, kind of putting their best foot forward. Uh, but you look at stride length and speed, you look at width, symmetry, and talgia. And talgia is like limping, classically not a neurological thing. Um, but if people are like not able to put weight on a foot, it means it's usually not coming from the neck. But they may complain of balance dysfunction. Just like if you sprained your ankle and you're not walking right, your balance can be off, but it has nothing to do with your nerves or your spinal cord. So looking at that gait can give you a sense of where the symptoms may be coming from. We always ask about tandem gait. So tandem gait is like putting one foot in front of the other like you're doing a sobriety test. That's an important test to kind of look at all the conduction. It takes a fair amount to be going right for you to be doing a good job with tandem gait, but a lot of things can throw that off. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a spinal cord problem, but we look at it every time. And then a Romberg is a test that looks at balance with the eyes closed. And that can be useful just to understand how well are the signals getting from your legs up to your brain and back down again kind of useful. I wouldn't say it's central. You can't hang your hat on that alone, but I think it's a part of the exam. It certainly goes into the, the gait evaluation as well. Now, when you're looking at people with cervical radiculopathy, for example, I think a very, very useful test is something called a Sperling's maneuver. So a Sperling's maneuver, if you think about it, when people have compression of a nerve, you do a maneuver that, that kind of compresses the nerve even further and see if it recreates the symptoms into the arm. Not just to they have pain, but so classically you'll turn your head, lean it back, compress down, axially load them, compress the nerve and see if it reproduces the symptoms into the arm. That is classically called a Sperling's maneuver. And it really, what it says to you is that it, symptoms are probably coming from the cervical spine. That's really what you're trying to make sure is it's not like a shoulder problem or an elbow problem or a carpal tunnel or some other thing. If you can go like this and kind of recreate the symptoms into the arm, it often means it's coming from the cervical spine. So Sperling's maneuver, I think, is really important. As I had alluded to at the beginning of this section, I check for cervical range of motion, neck palpation, peripheral nerve exam, and a shoulder exam, and all that is part of the exam, but a little bit outside of the scope of what we're gonna talk about here. The idea of doing all these tests is to try to understand if the physical findings that they have on your exam are concordant with the theories you have about where their symptoms are coming from to kind of make sure their symptoms and their exam match up. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.